Excited, hilarious, and bent on striking a blow. From Abducting a General by Patrick Lee Fermer. The next day was given over to planning with Billy and Mickey and Elias, who had both come with me for the purpose. Apart from them, only Manoli and George, utterly discreet, had been told of our plan and sworn in. New initiates were only sworn in when it was necessary for each of us to know the parts we had to play. On each, in turn, the news had the same electric effect. We decided that the general's car should not only be used as a false scent, but as a getaway device as well. It should whisk the general and some of his captors from the scene at high speed, where it would be tempting to drive due south across the Masara Plain and embark at Sutsuro or some other comb on the south coast. This obvious scheme had several drawbacks. Firstly, it would be obvious to the Germans too. They knew we used those waters, and the way back to the main party for our only driver, Billy, after planting the car far away, would be too long and dangerous. Secondly, we would be fast on the move and thus off the air to Cairo for some time. Thirdly, should the enemy pick up our scent, those excellent roads could transport the large garrisons of the plain to the empty forbidden zone of the low hills along the coast in a couple of hours. If necessary, they could fill the region with all the Germans in the fortress of Crete. A cordon along the waterline and another inland could prevent any craft putting in and by intercepting our runners, cut us off from our distant wireless links with Cairo. Finally, with our backs to the sea, in that region of sparse cover, they could run us to ground. Far better to let the car, like a magic carpet, deposit us close to the high mountains, with friendly shepherds for guides and caves and ravines to hide in, until the first furore should die down. Runners could move fast and freely there. We could pick up our broken links with Cairo and, via the SOE, with the BBC, the RAF and the Navy, and arrange an evacuation further west. Above all, even with a slow-moving general on our hands, we could move more quickly than the enemy troops. We would find a mule for him and, if the country grew too steep, put together a rough and ready palanquin. And there was always Pickaback. A glance at the map at once indicated the vast bulk of Mount Ida, sprawling across a quarter of the island and climbing to over 8,000 feet. A familiar refuge to most of us, but to the enemy, a daunting and perilous labyrinth, haunted by guerrilla bands and outlaws. Not even a garrison of 50,000 men could completely cordon off that colossal massive. There would be gaps. A single road ran westward along the north coast to Rotimo and Kanea. South of this, the foothills climbed abruptly to the famous guerrilla village above which the welcoming chaos soared. North of the road, and a couple of miles further west, a footpath ran four miles down the Helenia Ravine to the sea. The point of junction would be the perfect place to leave the car. The place sprang to mind as, last year, I had waited three days there for Ralph Stockbridge and John Stanley to land by submarine. They had announced their safe arrival by releasing carrier pigeons. We would indicate to the enemy that we had left with the general by similar means and scatter the path with corroborative detail. There was only one drawback to this. Heraklion is girdled 
by a high Venetian city wall, unless it was an advantage. The only road from point A to this desirable region ran clean through the heart of the city. It had one way in and one way out. There was a huge enemy garrison and numerous roadblocks and checkpoints. Anoyea was 20 miles on the wrong side of the city. There was no way round. But, we reasoned, after dark in the blackout, the occupants of the car would be dim figures. All that the people in the street, and then sentries and the patrols, and the parties at the check posts would be able to see, would be the hats, and two figures in German uniform in the front. And a shout of, put out that light, would stop them peering closer. Point A was only four miles from the town. With any luck, we would be through it and away within half an hour of the capture, even less. The car would be observed driving normally in the streets, then leaving Heracleon westward. Why not? By the time his staff began to grow uneasy, or the car was discovered, when I hoped the story of our submarine flight would come into play, we would have a long start up the side of Mount Ida. Mickey and Elias and I had discussed these possibilities in Heracleon. Billy's thoughts, from poring over the map, had been heading in a similar direction. And Manoli and George, when they were called in, leapt at the idea. Now that the scheme was decided, it seemed the only possible one. The results of a mishap in the town were too disastrous to contemplate. But a plunge straight into the enemy's stronghold with their captured commander would be the last idea to occur to them. We were excited and hilarious at the prospect, and Mickey and Elias sped back to Heraklion. Next morning, after marching a day and a night non-stop, Borzalis arrived with his men. They were festooned with bandoliers and bristling with daggers, like lobsters, as they say. But some of their arms were poor. We could help here. A few had been mustered in a hurry to complete the old giant's nucleus. The oldest men were white-haired and heavily whiskered. The youngest had scarcely begun shaving. They were all in the hills out of pure patriotism, free of politics, and bent on striking a blow, whatever it might be. They refused the idea of a day's rest. We had a meal under the leaves. Our own party, by slipping on battle dress tops and replacing their turbans with berets, assumed a semblance of uniform, each beside his Cretan haversack, was slung with several Marlin guns. Billy and I made a similar change. We waited for dusk to conceal our little column, now twenty-five strong, and moved off down the glen. I wanted to get them all to Scalani in a single giant stride, but it was too far to cover those rocks in the pitch dark. One or two of the elder gorillas fell out, rather understandably. We just managed to reach Carasso when the sky was growing pale. We hid all day in the lofts and cellars of two friendly houses, and set off again, wind and raven-fed at nightfall, striking due west over flatter and thus more dangerous country. We waded through streams, noisy with frogs, and passed through villages, where the device of shouting in German again came to our help. Soon after midnight, the guerrillas, the Russians, and some of our party were safely hidden in a cave, with a door containing an old wine press. A little further down the dried-up riverbed, Billy, Manoli, George and I, were soon under Pablo's roof, 
only five miles from Heraklion and less than a mile from point A.